Hi and welcome. My name is Victor Gijsbers and I teach philosophy at Leiden University in the Netherlands. In this series of videos we are looking at David Lewis's book On the Plurality of Worlds. And in this video I want to look at the first four sections of chapter 2. Chapter 2 is called Paradox in Paradise? Question mark. Well, the answer to that question is going to be no. Right? Lewis wants to give us a paradise, a modal paradise for philosophers. And that paradise is the realm of all the possible worlds. Right? That's what he wants to give us. And so in the first four sections of chapter two, he is going to look at four attempts to suggest that there's something fundamentally wrong with the idea of, of this realm of possible worlds. And then in the later sections of chapter two, which are generally a bit more substantial, he is going to look at what he calls some milder, uh, although still pretty strong objections to his philosophical project. So let us look at those first four objections. Uh, and objection number one is in paragraph 2.1, everything is actual question mark. And one way to, to understand this, um, um, the problem that is given here is a, a sentence at the top of page 98, where the trouble that, that would supposedly be for Lewis's theory is phrased as follows. More of actuality is no substitute for unactualized possibility. Right, so the worry here would be this, that this entire realm of possible worlds that Lewis gives us, that is just what is actual. And so there actually are no possibilities anywhere, right? There's just all of this stuff that, are, that exists, that is actual, um, and none of that is a real possibility. And so we don't actually have any possibilities. And Lewis's theory doesn't give us any possibilities. It just goes, gives us an actuality that is way, way, way bigger than we originally thought that actuality would be. Now, Lewis's answer to this is going to be, um, well, in essence, it's going to be the rejection of the idea that whatever exists is actual, right? And he's going to say, no, no, look, with actual, I only mean this world or the world where you are. It's an indexical term. With possible, I mean, you know, whatever happens in one of these worlds, that is my theory. So your worry, it doesn't work. Right? It, 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 you can only phrase the worry by using those words in a way that they are not used in my theory. And so it can't be a worry about my theory. And there's some plausibility to that. Right? There's some justification to Lewis saying that. Uh, although, on the other hand, you know, there also seems to be something true about this worry, or at least something intelligible about this worry, that just turns out to be inexpressible in the words that Lewis, or in the meaning that the words have for Lewis, right? I mean, if you think that, you know, a possibility must be real in some different kind of sense than an actuality, or maybe it's not real at all, um, whereas these possible worlds are real, mm, that, you know, there seems to be some, some philosophical idea there although a philosophical idea that might be particularly hard to, to phrase, to make explicit. For my money, what's going on here is that if you have bought into as much of the Lewisian apparatus as, as you need in order to you know, get to chapter two, then this worry becomes kind of impossible to even, to even formulate. And Lewis is quite right to dismiss it, to dismiss it. Uh, doesn't mean that there aren't like fundamentally different ways of thinking about modality that could, from the point of view of which you could, from the paradigm of which you could phrase uh, a rejection of Lewis's theory in precisely these terms. But that's not really on the table, right? Lewis never, in on the plurality of worlds, he never thinks um, about ways of understanding modality that don't use possible worlds. He is going to look at different ways of understanding possible worlds, ways different from his own, but he never works out or, or even, you know, really says anything about ways of understanding modality that do not rely on possible worlds. And you would have to do that and you would have to build up um, at least some kind of story and some way of using, using modal terms in this very different framework in order to even phrase the worry 
that section 2.1 suggests. Okay, Lewis doesn't do that, and presumably, I would say, uh, the kind of people with whom Lewis is, discuss is discussing here don't do that. And so this worry kind of falls by the wayside. And that's where, where we'll leave it to for now. So here's another question. Um, all worlds in one, says question, uh, is, uh, is section 2.2. And here, and in the next section, we get into, into discussions about how many worlds there are and whether there isn't some paradox about worlds that we can, that we can formulate. Right, and here would be would be the um, uh, the way that that it works in in two point two, right? Suppose that there's all these possible worlds, right? There's a lot of them, and any subset of these possible worlds is, according to Lewis, a proposition, right? Propositions just are subsets of possible worlds. Now, suppose that we assume that propositions can in some way be exemplified in possible worlds, right? For instance, by being thought, right? If suppose that for every proposition, there's a possible world where somebody is thinking that proposition. And so there must be at least as many worlds as there are propositions. And so there must be at least as many worlds as there are subsets of the set of all possible worlds. And so if we, and if you are not familiar with this terminology, I wouldn't worry too much about it, or I would look it up, one of those two. Um, but what this claims is that the cardinality of the set of possible worlds, that is sort of the size of this infinite set, the cardinality of the set of possible worlds um, must be equal to the cardinality of the set of subsets of the set of possible worlds. And it is a very well-known theorem of, of mathematics that those two things are not equal, that one of them is bigger than the other. And so there's a paradox. If we assume that any subset of possible worlds can in some sense appear in another possible world, that for instance, every proposition is thinkable. And so what Lewis does is he says, well, clearly um, that assumption is false, right? Clearly there are many propositions that cannot be thought because they, they make no sense. I, 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 he doesn't really phrase it that way, but they are too wild, right? They are infinitely wild. There is no, no intelligence could think them. Um, there's no way to fit them into any of these possible worlds. So that's how he seeks to diffuse 2.2, uh, and that is more or less the same way that he's gonna seek to diffuse 2.3. So here's what 2.3 says. Um, suppose that you have all these possible worlds, like all of them, and now we're gonna make a new world just by pasting all of them together, right? So there's all these possible worlds and now we paste them together into a new world. Hey, that's impossible, right? There's a paradox. We had all of them and now we've made a new one, which was not one of the ones that we already had because, you know, all the ones that we already had are parts of this new one. Um, how do we deal with that? Well, Lewis says, how we deal with that is that we limit the size of possible worlds. Uh, we're gonna say that they, maybe not that they have to be finite in space and time, but at least that they, you know, how big they can be, that there's some kind of limit. I don't know exactly where it is, but there must be some kind of limit. Hey, here's one reason why there must be some kind of limit. Otherwise, we immediately get into these paradoxes. Okay, as I don't know. I don't know whether there's something arbitrary about this. Um, I don't have an opinion about that, but um, but that's the way that Lewis tries to tries to defuse this this problem, right? And it's a problem that is sort of inherent in the notion of this principle of recombination, of this cut and paste principle. If anything can be brought together to make something new, um, then it seems that you know if you have everything that you can make that way that can be the ingredient for something new that you can that you can make right by recombining them and bringing them together in uh, in certain ways and so lewis needs some way of limiting that if he doesn't want to get into into this kind of this kind of paradox although i guess he could also do something which from his perspective would be way more radical um which is to say that you know there's that just too many possible worlds to apply set theory to them you know, something like that. Um, and why not? Okay, why not? That's a question about 
the philosophy of the infinite or the philosophy of set theory or or something like that. Uh, Lewis doesn't delve into it. Lewis loves set theory. Um, he's really in this Quinean tradition where set theory is supposed to be, you know, one of the main things that we can be certain about. Um, in fact, you know, among the few things that Lewis thinks quite unproblematically exist are sets. Uh, and so, you know, ditching set theory doesn't really seem to be on the table here. Here's 2.4. How can we know, right, if possible worlds are out there in the sense of they're isolated spatiotemporally, they're isolated causally, uh, and whenever we make claims about what is possible, what is not possible, we are making claims about possible worlds. How can we know that? Right? Because we can't see those other possible worlds. We can in no way get any information about them. There's no telescope uh, in uh, Kripke's uh, metaphor that allows us to view other possible worlds uh, and learn something about them. So how can we get any knowledge about possibilities if possibilities are the kinds of things that Lewis tells us they are? That's a very good question. Lewis's answer is basically this. He says, look, this question is based on the idea that to get knowledge, you must be in causal contact with something, right? Something must cause effects on you, or at least you must be able to observe something that is going to sort of generate or have effects on whatever you want to know something about. Um, it's only in case of causal relations that we can get knowledge about something. Right? If I want to know anything about what's going on in Australia, I had better get into causal contact with Australia. I could go there or I could talk to people who have been there or I could read things written by people who were there, but there needs to be some kind of causal relation. Okay, how do we, how do we, um, how do we get around that? Because clearly we are not in causal contact with these other possible worlds. Well, here is what, what Lewis tells us. He says, causal relations are necessary only for knowledge about contingent things and not for knowledge about necessary things. We don't need causal connections to find out what has to be the case, we only need it to find out whether A or B is the case when A and B are both possible. So yes, if I want to know whether, you know, there are elephants in Australia, I should get into causal contact with Australia because it's both possible that there are animal uh, elephants there and possible that there are no elephants there. And so I had better have a causal relation to Australia before I make any pronouncements about this. On the other hand, if I want to know whether there are elephants and no elephants in Australia, well, I don't need any causal relations. That is clearly false because it's impossible for there to be both elephants and no elephants in Australia. So when it comes to necessary truths, Lewis says, no causal relation is necessary. And claims about possibility are necessary truths. If A is possible, then it is necessarily the case that A is possible. It's not contingent that A is possible. And so Lewis is actually like sort of embracing here this, um, uh, this well-known axiom from modal logic that if it is possible that P, then it is necessarily possible that P. And so Lewis tells us, and this is page 112, that we do not find out by observation what possibilities there are. How do we find out what possibilities there are? By the principle of recombination. Right? How do we know that the principle of recombination is correct? Well, I guess that is some kind of basic metaphysical insight, maybe based on the kinds of arguments that David Hume gave against necessary connections. There's one qualification that Lewis doesn't really make here. Um, and but that I think we should make. There is a sense in which we find out by observation what possibilities there are, because we find out by observation which properties there are in our world, and those form the basis of any application of the principle of recombination. Um, and so actually, you know, there's one sense in which observation is important, and there's one sense in which our knowledge of possibility is based on observation. Right? And then we have this vague sense that there might also be alien properties, but we don't really know anything about that. Right? So whenever we really know that there is a possibility, even on Lewis's own theory, there's a minimal way in which that is based on, on perception, 
on causal relations, uh, but it's based on causal relations in our own world, right? Our acquaintance with certain properties. Uh, so that still fits within Lewis's answer. So when it comes to sections 2.1 to 2.4, I would say that Lewis is relatively successful in addressing these objections. I think the objection of section 2.1 is deeper than Lewis gives its credit for. Um, but there's no way to frame that objection in a way that does justice to its deepness without developing an entirely different theory of modality an entirely different framework of thinking from within that would be po from within which that would be possible um the other the other objections you know i mean they they might require lewis to to make some concession or to um or to to claim that there must be a certain kind of limitation on on what is possible in the possible world but none of it seems really harmful so we will look at um at the in a sense more substantial objections having to do, for instance, with skepticism, having to do with moral uh, indifference in um, a future video.